Um, so uh, it shouldn't come as a surprise. I'm not a CISO. Um, hopefully, never will be. Um, and so uh, this is a rather technical talk. Uh, if you're a CISO, you're probably in over your head. <laughs> uh, okay, good. It's good if I haven't scared anyone away yet. Um, so what I'm going to talk about today is how to use electronic equipment, apparently. Um, so increasingly, compiler writers are taking advantage of undefined behaviors in uh, C and C++ programming languages to improve optimizations. Uh, I've been uh, participating on the C standards committee uh, since about 2004. Um, so I actually was uh, involved in uh, C, uh, the development of C11 from start to end, uh, which has recently occurred to me that now I'm sort of responsible in a way <laughs> for, for C. Um, and, um, and, and, you know, during that time, we like to think the language is getting better, but uh, more secure. But actually, it's, it's becoming less secure uh, because the, it's still the, the biggest driver uh, for the evolution of C language is, is opportunity for greater optimization. And the less well-defined the language is, the more opportunity you have to optimize it. Uh, you know, so I, I frequently get into these discussions where I'll, we're saying, you know, um, you know, if, if six turns out to be nine, do you care how fast you got that result? Uh, and apparently they do. <laughs> um, so, so frequently these optimizations tend to interfere with the ability of developers or security analysts or security tools to really analyze the code and determine what it's doing, right? And so what happens is there's code that looks like it's there, it looks like it's doing something, but it's actually being removed from the compiler. Uh, and then it becomes very difficult for a humans or a source code analysis tool that's not uh, implementation specific to uh, analyze the behavior. Uh, so this is leading to increased faults in software, uh, and uh, those are leading to increased vulnerabilities. Uh, oh, there we go. Set the wrong direction. So, um, so some years ago, I authored this vulnerability note with uh, Chad Doherty at CERT. This was April 2008, so this was quite a while ago. Uh, and this was about GCC. But maybe in the last two weeks, there was the exact same sort of uh, uh, vulnerability was noted in, in the Clang compiler. So I'm not sure if it took them nine years to catch up with how bad GCC is or uh, <laughs> They, you know, people just got around to noticing. But um, some of these open source compilers are sort of the, the wild west of, of compilers, and I'll, I'll chat a little bit more about why that's the case. Um, yep, still going the wrong way. So uh, undefined behaviors. Um, so I, you know, when I joined the C committee, my goal was to make more C a more secure language, and then, you know, to change C to make it more secure. And of course, what happened was that C wound up changing me instead. Um, and and really, um, you know, it's a very it's a very bright group of people who are involved in the C standards committee. And uh, if you give if you give a very bright group of people the set of requirements they they were given, uh, they produce the C language. You know, if you give them a different set of requirements, they produce Java. Right, but um, but C is the language that you get given given the goals they had, and undefined behaviors. Um, you know, although this is sort of misunderstood, or or they're not there by accident. They're intentionally put there, and uh, you know the idea is that they're there because they belong there. Um, but one of the mistakes I think the uh, committee made was uh, they, this term undefined behavior is actually too broad because it encompasses really three completely different kinds of things. So the first one is it gives the implementers license not to catch certain kinds of errors that are difficult to diagnose. Um, and, and so one thing about the committee, it's, it's, I mean, C standards written by C developers, uh, C compiler vendors for C compiler vendors. And they don't like to be particularly hard on each other, right? So kind of like, well, hey, Joe, if it's too rough, you know, don't worry about it. Go home, have dinner with your wife, you know, no problem. So, uh, so the, but this is also meant because there are, you know, there are cases that are MP complete or MP hard that just take too much processing uh, to, to, you know, be, uh, you know, to always know that you're going to diagnose a problem. So consequently, these uh, compilers are not required to diagnose these problems. The second one is to avo uh, avoid defining obscure corner cases. Okay, so it turns out um, 
let's say you have int min, small assigned integer number, most negative number, and you take the remainder after dividing by minus one. Okay, can anyone tell me what result you get? Okay, large negative number divided by minus one, what's the remainder? Anybody? If you're thinking this long, you're thinking too hard. Zero? You say zero? Yeah, you get zero. Okay, you divide something by minus one, there's zero things left over. It's kind of the same thing as dividing by one. Okay, on an Intel processor, if you do that, what you get is a segmentation fault. <laughs> okay, and in, in C99, um, that was what was called implicit undefined behavior. So it was undefined behavior, but they didn't tell you about it. And so for C11, um, you know, I submitted a proposal and we discussed it in committee and we wound up modifying the language to make it explicit undefined behavior. And the reason is um, the C committee doesn't want to pu publish uh, people who write code for the Intel platform to make them add an extra test to test for this edge condition because that would slow down the compilers. And the result of that is um, the burden of doing these checks kind of gets deferred to the programmer. So that's the second reason. The third reason is to identify errors as a possible, uh, possible conforming language extension. So here, for example, when you do an F open on a file, there's a few different modes that you can specify. And if you specify anything else, it's undefined behavior, okay? So if you put a Y in as a mode, uh, you know, do you think it's gonna crash? Um, you know, absolutely not, right? So, so the reason they did that was, um, you know, the standard has to run on a variety of platforms. Uh, file systems have a lot of inconsistencies and in different features that aren't available on all platforms. So that's a mechanism to allow implementations to extend the behavior of their implementation to match their file system. So that's a third completely different reason. But they're all classified as undefined behavior and a compiler can uh, ignore undefined behavior completely with unpredictable results. Typically the committee will say uh, the compiler can go off and play the game of life at that point and that's allowed for by the standard. The second is behave in a documented manner, characteristic of the environment. So example, when you say int min remainder minus one, on Intel platform it characteristically faults. That's the behavior of that platform. That's uh, an allowed behavior. Or it could terminate translation or execution with a diagnostic. That's, that's the most you could hope for. So the, uh, the basic concept, the basic design of an optimizing uh, compiler for C is largely the same as for any other language. Basically, you try to um, replace uh, computations with more efficient uh, methods that produce the same result. So, uh, so, some, so here's the you know, uh, gross oversimplification I have. Um, some optimizations uh, eliminate undefined behaviors. Uh, we'll call those the good optimizations. And then we have the ones that introduce vulnerabilities, and we'll call those the bad optimizations. Um, oh, by the way, I, I worked with this. Uh, I, I used to work with David Keaton, who's the chair of the uh, C Standards Committee now, the convener of the International C Standards Committee. And he, he didn't like the fact that I called this talk dangerous optimizations. He thought I should have just called it optimizations. And, and that's a little window into the mindset of people in the C committee. Um, okay, so, so the C standard um, specifies the results of a computation as if on an abstract machine, uh, but doesn't specify the methods that are used. So in the abstract machine, the, the semantics have to closely follow what the specification says, but an actual implementation doesn't have to uh, you know, reproduce all the same steps uh, if it can conduce that, you know, for example, value is not needed or uh, that there's no uh, side effects occurring that uh, would require, you know, that code to be executed. So basically the compilers, uh, optimizers free to choose any method that produces uh, the correct result. So, uh, so this gives the compiler the leeway to remove cause that's deemed unused or unneeded when building a program. And this is typically referred to as the as if rule because the program has to, has to run as if it were executing on the abstract machine, but it doesn't have to follow all the exact methods. And occasionally you'll, you'll see a little bit of, uh, uh, you know, you'll see two places in the standard. You'll see a volatile, uh, with volatile and with memset underbar s where there's language in the standard that says, uh, must uh, operate, you know, according to the rules of the abstract machine. So those are two places where the standard says that um, 
you know, you can't, you, the as if rule doesn't apply. You have to implement the semantics exactly. So with volatile, for example, if you say x equals x and x is volatile qualified, you need to read the variable x and then you need to write the variable x back out. But if that wasn't volatile qualified, that code would be optimized out for sure. Um, OK, so compiler vendors uh, use various implementation strategies. Uh, one strategy is hardware behavior, where you basically generate the assembly code and you let the hardware do whatever the hardware does. Uh, and for many years, that was kind of how C worked. So you know, the people in the room with the, the gray hair, the white hair, or the no hair uh, probably have been exposed to that type of programming. Uh, another model, super debug, where you trap any undefined behavior. Uh, great for debugging, uh, very impractical for uh, deploying code because it uh, has significant slowdowns. And third is total license. In total license, you can treat any uh, possible undefined behaviors that a can't happen condition, which allows you to optimize out, uh, optimize aggressively. So just to start with a simple one. Uh, constant folding is the process of simplifying constant expressions at compile time. So constant expressions can be uh, simple literals, such as the integer 2, uh, variables that are never modified, or variables that are explicitly uh, marked as constant. So again, to go back to my old example, if you get your Intel processor out uh, and you say it min uh, remainder minus 1, you print the result that says 0. And that gives you a um, sort of a misleading sen sense of warmth that your um, your, your implementation is going to produce a zero result. Uh, but what's happening in this case is that uh, int min and remainder one is a constant expression. So it's actually the compiler that replaces that with a zero. So there's no runtime code uh, being generated. So if you were to replace this code, oh, and I think I have. Oh, so here's, um, here's this code compiled on Microsoft Visual Studio with optimization disabled. So you know, these, these optimizations are so automatic that you cannot disable them. They just happen. Um, and you can see that we're just pushing zero onto the stack and printing it out. So there's no division operation uh, being generated here. So if you actually want to see what's happening, uh, you have to uh, use sort of non-deterministic values. Uh, and then you can see that we're going to generate an IDIV instruction. Uh, which will now fault uh, when you provide it min and minus one is uh, the arguments. So, uh, so a little lesson here is that when you're writing these little tests to test behavior, uh, be very careful that the program's doing something. Otherwise, the compiler is very, very likely to optimize out your little test, and you're not going to be testing what you think you were testing. Um, okay, so this is the uh, this is the kind of the major vol that I'm going to chat about. This is the one that uh, Chad and I published back in 2008. Uh, but, you know, it's, I mean, the thing is, it's not really a bold. This is how the compiler works, and it still works this way today. So when you read the C standard, there's a clause that says, uh, when an expression that has inner type is added to or subtracted from a pointer, the result has the type of the pointer operand. Uh, so that's basically just defining pointer arithmetic. And uh, array uh, indexing notation is, is sort of a syntactic veneer for pointer arithmetic. If you index an array p at uh, index n, it's just going to expand to to p plus uh, n scaled for the size of the element uh, type and then dereferenced. So C goes further to say, um, I got a, a laser pointy thing on here. I can remember. Oh, here we are. So uh, what this paragraph says is that you can form this pointer and dereference this value, and you can form every pointer uh, up to here, and you can dereference this value. And the C standard requires that you can form this pointer. Okay, this is well-defined behavior. The C standard has to support the formation of this pointer, but if you dereference this value, it's undefined behavior. And if you form this next pointer, it's also undefined behavior. So what the C standard allows is that you can form the one too far pointer, the too far pointer. Uh, and the reason for that was in the early days of C programming, people wrote loops where they incremented the pointer and then tested to see if it was this one and then stopped the loop. And so the, sta the standards committee decided to allow that uh, behavior. Uh, and, and so it's, it's now enshrined in the language. OK, so, um, so a typical thing uh, a C programmer might do if they've 
uh, taken my you know, secure coding in C and C++ course is they might decide um, you know, we should be concerned about buffer overflows <laughs> because they've, they've got unintended consequences. Um, so uh, to do that, you might have a, uh, say, a pointer to the beginning of array, a uh, pointer to the end of the array, and you might have a, a size uh, which you would express as a size t argument, not an int. And uh, I, I, part of my secure coding course, I have one day committed to talking about integers. So um, if you you ever have time for that, I'll explain why it needs to be size t. But the easy thing is just to declare it size t for now. <laughs> um, and so we'll do a test to see if pointer plus len is greater than max. That means we're trying to uh, to reference a location beyond the bounds of the array, uh, and so we'll return an error condition in that case. But no matter what your implementation is, what your model is, uh, there's a bug in this code, which is for very large values of len, pointer plus len can uh, wrap around, which would create undefined behavior. And under the hardware behavior model, the result would typically uh, wrap around and point to an address that's actually lower in memory than pointer, okay? So, to fix the bug, an experienced programmer who sort of internalized this uh, hardware behavior model of undefined behavior uh, might add a test where they test to see if pointer plus len is less a pointer to detect the, uh, the wraparound behavior, okay? So the reason I said experienced programmer there, and I'll give you a little more insight into the C standards committee, okay? Uh, say you're trying to get a feature or something changed in the C standard. Uh, the best way to do that is say, uh, you know, hey, I work for Intel, and we've just added this vectorized instruction, but there's no way to, to, to use it from C code. Can we modify the C language so that programmers can use our new vectorized instruction? And they'll say yes, because the C standard very, you know, they like to support hardware. <laughs> you know, it, that's the purpose is to give you access to the hardware. Okay, the second thing you could do is you can go and say, you know, we've noticed that naive programmers uh, frequently make the following error, right? And it turns out the C standard committee does not give a shit about naive programmers, okay? So that argument d doesn't fly at all, you know? Um, we had an hour discussion about some behavior where no one in the committee knew the answer. We had to spend an hour kind of going back and forth till we could sort out how something worked. And then a guy from Cisco who doesn't have a compiler, he's just got a bunch of developers, said, and you expect developers to know this. And in unison, the entire committee said, yes, absolutely. <laughs> um, so if you come to them and you say, you know, an experienced programmer such as yourself might make this mistake, uh, you've got a chance of them listening to you. So that's, that's why it was couched in those, these terms. Um, so... So a compiler that follows a total license model, like uh, GCC and now Clang, uh, may optimize out the uh, first part of this check, leaving the bounds defeated. Okay, so the reason for this is because if a pointer plus an unsigned len compares less than pointer, then undefined behavior has occurred, okay? So the, the exact undefined behavior that has occurred is that, um, you know, if I take a pointer to this array and I add a size, and now I'm checking to see if it wrapped around, uh, without a doubt, I just try to form a pointer which was outside the bounds of the array. And by this language in the standard, that makes that undefined behavior, okay? So this, this code invokes undefined behavior, you know? So consequently, uh, the, the compiler can assume undefined behavior doesn't occur, and it can remove that code as dead code. Okay, so that sounds bad, uh, but th then, you, you know, when you look at it, you start to see how this comes about, right? So what's going on here, the optimization is called algebraic simplification, uh, which, you know, sounds like something we all did in sixth grade algebra. Um, so the, the, the optimization says that uh, Optimization may be, may be performed for comparisons between P and V1 and P and V2, where P is the same pointer and V1 and V2 are integer uh, variables. And so total license model allows that to be reduced to comparison between V1 and V2. However, if V1 or V2 uh, overflow when added to P, uh, the results of comparing those two values directly is not the same as doing the arithmetic and then doing the comparison. And so the, one of the fun things about digital arithmetic 
is that because of possible overflows, uh, computer arithmetic doesn't always obey uh, the algebraic identities of mathematics. Uh, so, you know, so it does, there, is ma there are mathematical models that describe uh, digital uh, uh, arithmetic, but they're not the ones you learned in sixth grade. Um, okay, so if you go back to our, our example, what you'll see is uh, this expression, pointer plus a little less than pointer, is the same. Uh, we can add zero to the uh, right-hand expression without changing that. Uh, and uh, now, basically, we have a comparison of p plus v1 compared to p plus v2. This can be simplified to a comparison between v1 and v2. And len cannot be less than 0 because len is unsigned. So consequently, this code doesn't do anything, and the compiler removes it. Okay? And our, uh, consequently, our, uh, you know, our bounds check has been defeated. Okay. So once you're aware of this problem, it's actually quite simple to fix. Uh, so, um, so if you know that pointers less than or equal to max, which we do in this case because pointer points the beginning of the array and max points to the end, uh, you can just subtract a uh, pointer from both sides and compare to see if len is greater than max minus pointer. Uh, so this won't wrap around because max is greater than pointer. And consequently, there is no undefined behavior here and the compiler is required to evaluate this expression at runtime, to generate the code and evaluate the expression. So, uh, so this code will always succeed. And it's a, it's a very easy fix to make, but you know, developers aren't always aware of this. And in fact, this particular defect occurred in, some, in the Plan 9 code written at Bell Labs. So you know, when I say experienced programmers make this mistake, you know, those guys are pretty, pretty experienced. <laughs> um, OK. So thanks to the magic of Google and the internet, uh, you can Google uh, the history of this on like the GCC dev list. And um, you'll see that a lot of people uh, said a lot of bad things to me when I try to report this problem on the GCC dev list. Uh, so you know, one thing that developers came back with was uh, they said, well, hey, if you have something like this, uh, this actually works to your advantage because it'll simplify this to a comparison between n and 100, uh, and that eliminates uh, possible wraparound in both those expressions. So this, this would, uh, the optimization here would eliminate undefined behaviors. That makes it a good optimization. Uh, in this case, it's probably not a big deal unless one expression wraps but not the other. So, uh, but, you know, you don't, you don't want to ship this code. And the reason you don't want to ship this code is because optimizations are optional, right? They're not required. You don't want to depend on an optimization to make your code correct. And so as a developer, what you'd want to do is perform the simplification yourself uh, and, and ship this code so and not rely on the compiler to make your code correct. Now, the other thing I'll say is, um, you know, a lot of developers would spot this code, but Frequently, the problem is that this sort of thing is hidden in macros. So it's not apparent when you look at the source code. It's not, uh, it's not apparent this is happening until you see the macro expansion. No questions so far? I scared a couple people away. They're like, wait a second. I'm a CISO, and <laughs> this guy is speaking some odd language. I don't understand. <laughs> um, OK. So the behavior pointer overflow changed as of the following versions of the compiler. I believe we're now on GCC 7.1, so this has happened a while ago. But one of the things you'll see here is that um, the, this changed in a maintenance release, okay? And, and when, you look at, um, when you look at portability behaviors, uh, undefined beha implementation defined, unspecified behavior, and undefined behaviors are all portability uh, issues. But uh, undefined behavior is the most severe, right? Because uh, there is no specification of that behavior, and so the compiler can do whatever it wants, right? And uh, and and you know, I, I I say a lot of things that sound like compiler writers are evil, but they're they're you know they're trying to uh, do the best they can for your code base, right? So so usually what they're doing is when they see undefined behavior they take a guess as to what maybe you were after, right? And, but if they guess wrong, if their guess doesn't meet your expectation, then you're going to have a defect. And the other thing that happens with undefined behaviors is that 
you know, compiler writers look at these as opportunities for optimizations. And so when they, you know, when they're done writing optimization, they'll release it as part of a maintenance release. And if your code had undefined behaviors, it may have worked previously and now it might, might fail because uh, the compiler now deals with that undefined behavior differently. Um, so this particular optimization is performed by default at O2 and above, include optimizing for space, not performed at O1 or O0. Uh, it can be enabled with a strict overflow option or disabled uh, for O2 and above with the no strict overflow option. The only way you could, okay, so here's how this optimization came about. There's a guy named Ian Lance Taylor and he's at Google and he uh, implemented this optimization, okay? and. Of all the people on the GCC dev list, uh, you know, he was the only one who didn't, you know, scream at me. He was the only one who had like a rational conversation with me. And, um, and basically, okay, here's Google's kind of uh, deal, right? Uh, they have a few applications they run a lot, okay? So they have these farms of computers and they looked at, um, you know, they looked at this optimization and they discovered, well, we could get uh, a half percent improvement uh, that would allow us to get rid, uh, and we know our code doesn't have this error, <laughs> right? And uh, they'll give us a half percent improvement. We could get rid of this number of machines and save $400,000 a year, right? So it looks really good to them to do this optimization. So they do it. Uh, and then everyone else gets this, and your code base maybe does have this problem, right? So, uh, so we had discussion with Ian, and uh, basically, they, they they kept this optimization in, right? But what we agreed was that they um, they set a flag uh, to sorry to um, to notify you that the optimization was being performed. So what you can do now is you can set strict overflow equals n, where n is greater than or equal to three, and now the compiler will warn when this optimization is taking place. Um, now the problem is this is not included in wall, okay? And probably the only way you would find out about this is if you came to my talk. Um, and if you came to my talk, you'd probably know not to have this undefined behavior. So, so today this is still, you know, a pretty significant problem. Um, okay, so there's a bunch of GCC options. Um, uh, F strict overflow allows the compiler to assume strict signed overflow behavior. Um, <laughs> Signed arithmetic overflow is undefined behavior, so the compiler will assume uh, that it doesn't happen, and that permits aggressive optimization. So for example, if you write i plus 10 e greater than i, uh, the compiler would just assume that's always true for uh, any signed value i. And of course, that's only true if uh, that, that expression doesn't wrap around. Um, so when this option's in effect, uh, any attempt to determine, okay, so, so this is kind of a key to this, um, you know, so most, <laughs> the worst code is code that's written for security, <laughs> either by developers or by security folks, okay? And part of the reason is um, it's, it's very easy to invoke undefined behavior when you're testing for undefined behavior, right? So you kind of say, hey, does this undefined behavior exist? And the compiler says, oh, he's just invoked undefined behavior and they take your test away. So your test disappears. So when you're writing tests for undefined behavior for security vulnerabilities, you have to be uh, very careful not to invoke undefined behavior. Um, so FRAPV uh, instructs GCC to uh, assume that signed arithmetic overflow of addition and subtraction multiplication will wrap around. So it's similar to no strict overflow, and it will um, disable optimizations that assume integer overflow behavior is undefined. Uh, so this is the option that was enabled for the Java front end uh, as required by the Java language specification. So the Java language, spec uh, Java language only has signed integers, and the signed integers have well-defined wraparound behavior. In C, you have unsigned uh, integers, which have well-defined wraparound behavior, and you have, signed you have signed integers, which have undefined behavior on overflow. Um, and of course, now GCC doesn't have a Java front end anymore. It just got removed as of uh, 7.1. Um, okay, so strict overflow equals n. 
This, of course, only applies when strict overflow is active, right? So in other words, um, this flag to diagnose this problem, this optimization, is only going to be triggered when you're performing the optimization. So if you, um, so you have to make sure that you're optimizing your code in order to detect these optimization errors. Um, so there's uh, three warning levels. Um, so an optimization which assumes signed overflow doesn't occur is safe. Uh, yeah, so this is always kind of the problem with C, right? So one of the premises of the C language is trust the programmer, right? And, and a good example of that is say you take an int and you assign it to a short, right? Uh, the compiler will look at that and think, huh, that looks pretty dodgy, right? I mean, uh, clearly you can't store all the values that can be represented as an int in a short, but uh, we're going to trust the programmer, uh, and we're going to trust that the programmer knows that the range of values being stored in this integer can be represented as a short. We're going to go ahead and make that uh, conversion. And the same thing is true with these, um, this code, right? Uh, these expressions don't necessarily overflow. It depends on the, uh, the, the values uh, that they take. So uh, at a setting of one, uh, it will warn about cases that are both questionable and easy to avoid, such as x plus one greater than x. Um, with strict overflow, the compiler will simplify this to one. And this is the, uh, the only level you, that's enabled by wall. Uh, higher levels aren't and have to be explicitly re requested. Uh, so strict overflow equals two will tell you about uh, other cases where comparison is simplified to a constant. So for example, if you take the absolute value of assigned integer value, um, it will return a negative value <laughs> for uh, you know, the most negative. So if you say absolute value of int min, uh, the answer is int min. You get the same negative value back. Uh, and that's because on a two's complement, machine, uh, you can't represent the, uh, the negation of int min. So uh, level three is the, uh, we'll also warn about other cases where comparison is simpl uh, comparison simplified. Uh, for example, x plus one greater than y being simplified to x greater than zero. And this is the lowest warning level which will warn on the uh, specific optimization I was describing earlier that eliminates the, uh, the bounds check. Uh, strict overflow equals four will also uh, warn on other simplifications like this arithmetic simplification, which I would think in almost all cases you would want to have this. Uh, and then five, uh, you know, will warn about cases where the compiler reduces the magnitude. Uh, so, um, so we've uh, some of the work I've done in the C standards committee. We uh, we introduce a C analyzability annex into uh, the C11 standard. It's a normative but optional annex, uh, so not everyone has to implement it. Um, I know for certain the Oracle, you know, the old Sun C compiler guys, they're implementing this annex. So what we did was we defined, we added a couple definitions. So we defined out of bounds store, and we defi defined uh, bounded undefined behavior as um, undefined behavior that doesn't perform an out of bounds store. And then we uh, defined the term critical undefined behavior, was, which is basically the old style of critical undefined behavior. So there are, by the way, 200 explicit undefined behaviors in the C language. Uh, and all 200 of them used to be critical undefined behaviors. So the requirement is that basically, um, besides a, a short list of critical undefined behaviors, uh, all undefined behaviors have to be bounded undefined behaviors if your compiler implements Annex L. Uh, and so now, instead of there being 200 undefined behaviors, you have to worry about writing out of bounds, you're, you're limited to nine. Uh, and the nine are, uh, are this particular list, the sorts of things that usually result in that. Okay, so uh, to kind of wrap this up, and I, uh, the wrap up here, sometimes uh, my recommendation surprises people at the end of this, uh, which is, uh, okay, uh, ignore undefined behaviors. Um, that's not a surprise. Um, you know, uh, having undefined behavior in your code doesn't mean your code is wrong, but it means that um, you know the compiler can change, and, and a future version of your code might be wrong. And so it's best not to depend on undefined behaviors. Uh, 
Um, I would recommend trying to find and eliminate dead code instead of letting the compiler do it. So if you can use a strict overflow flag uh, to indicate it's rewriting the code because there's undefined behavior, like that example of you know n plus 100 compared to you know n plus 3 or whatever, you know do the do the simplification yourself so you're not relying on the compiler uh, to do the optimization. Um, so so we've seen that. Um, some optimizations can eliminate undefined behaviors, while others will introduce vulnerabilities. So, uh, a lot of uh, you know security people uh, who don't quite know what they're talking about will, you know, well first you know most a lot of people will ignore this completely, right? Not know anything about this, but then you learn a little bit about it, and then you think, oh, we should ha enforce wraparound behavior, and frankly, that's not the recommendation I would give. And the reason is because you're turning off all the optimizations, and many of those optimizations are fixing your code, <laughs> and some of those optimizations are breaking your code. But generally speaking, if you just turn them off, your code is going to get worse um, in terms of quality and security, and it's going to get slower at the same time. So my recommendation is go ahead and build optimized code, but turn on the warning flag to find out where the compiler is doing these optimizations for you, and take a look. And if it's optimizing on an assumption that's different than your assumption, uh, your assumption's wrong, <laughs> and you need to revise your code. Um, and uh, finally, you know, tell your vendor to implement Annex L and use it because it's cool. And uh, finally. Um, the C standard is a contract between compiler writers and programmers, but really only compiler writers show up for these, and me, and the guy from Cisco. And so we've had votes that have been 30 to 2, where Cisco, you know, Cisco and me vote the same way and everyone else is against us. And, and sometimes they have reasons because, well, that's hard to do, uh, you know, so they don't want to do it. Um, so the contract's continually being amended. Uh, and you know, unless more security conscious groups sort of get involved, the tendency is to is to eliminate guarantees from the standard. It's kind of like you know getting divorced from your spouse and telling your spouse to you know just handle the the divorce and you'll be happy whatever the outcome is. Um, you know that's not going to work out good for you, my friend. <laughs> um, okay, so I'm done. Uh, I'll take some questions. Yeah, sir. Yeah. Uh, um, yeah, I teach at conferences. I did a three-day course here on secure coding in Java, but we also come on site and deliver on site. And the on-site deliveries are generally more popular, just because it's easier to fly me somewhere than it is to fly thirty people to a conference. But uh, yeah, let me know, and we can come uh, come to your site and deliver that for you, uh, sir. How do compilers tend to be? Oh, other compilers? Um, I haven't looked at all of them. Um, you know, I now know that Clang behaves similarly. Um, you know, Visual Studio, for how, however much people hate Microsoft, I mean, they're, they're a little bit more reasonable because they, they're, they're controlled by one vendor. They don't have this wild west where everyone's looking out for their own interests sort of thing. Um, so, yeah, so it's kind of, you have to look. You know, I mean, I'll, t I'll tell you, I'll tell you some other like random frightening things. But you know, when you get a C compiler, uh, it, it it will have an there will be an implementation, a set of flags where it conforms to the standard. It might not be the default set of flags. So you know, the out of the box compiler you, you use might be non-conforming to the C standard. You know, so some of those compilers do really wacky things. The IBM compiler um, actually treats uh, unsigned integers is un wraparound is undefined behavior, which is a violation of the standard. So by default, it behaves in a non-conforming mode. But they basically, you know, these compilers grow up with their users and their their code bases, and they're sort of designed to work with the code that's, you know, uses these compilers to for compilation. Um, any other questions, sir? Um, this is a problem generally for static analysis tools uh, because a lot of static analysis tools um, work for multiple different platforms, right? So they can sell it more widely. And so it's kind of very difficult for them to 
know what the specific optimizations are that different compilers are performing. So th this class of problems frequently not diagnosed. And that was actually my first slide, that these optimizations really make it hard for human analysts, static analysis, uh, or you know, anything else to uh, detect. And, and certainly, you know, the thing that irritates me the most about all of this is you know, when the compiler vendor says, hey, this is undefined, I can optimize here, they know it's undefined. They could generate a warning at that point, but usually they don't. So you have to kind of bug them, to, like this GCC case, to go back and add the warning. Uh, so anyone's even being notified uh, that the undefined behavior is there. I mean, they know it's there, and they're not frequently not diagnosing it. Sorry? Oh, yeah. So you should look at your warnings. <laughs> I, I mean, so I, uh, I've had a lot of customers who are going to go buy Fortify or Coverity or some expensive analysis tool, but they aren't, you know, they don't have their warning level set and aren't paying attention to the warnings. Um, I, I, I have done a study uh, while I was at CMU, and, and really the compilers are more effective at diagnosing these type of problems than the analysis tools. So before you go, you know, I, I, I think, you know, you should use static analysis tools, but before you buy them, you know, set your warning level to the highest level and address those warnings. And, you know, address them smartly, because right, a lot of people will go in and say, well, if I put cast all over the place, it'll shut the warnings up. Okay, now your code's worse than it was before, because you have all the same problems, but now you're not getting diagnostics anymore. Okay, any other questions? This is fun, come on. Let's keep going. <laughs> no? Yeah. About the new developers, you were, you were saying in the beginning that the C language has actually become more insecure. Yep. Are there now maybe new developments in the standards committee uh, that add new, more secure features to C language? Um, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a little bit of give and take. You know, I mean, so there are places where guarantees are weakened. Um, I'll give you a quick example. When you read on initialized memory now, um, this committees introduce a concept of wobbly values, right? So that means that every time you read on initialized value, you can get a different value. So you could have an express, you could say if x do this, and then and it would do it, and then down below you could say if not x do this, and it would do that too. <laughs> because if it's uninitialized, it can now vary every time you read it. Um, so, so that's an area where the language is becoming less defined. Um, but, you know, we've added Annex K, which is balance checked interfaces. Those are nice, secure functions. Um, you know, we've added uh, memset under bar S, which can't be optimized out. So it lets you, uh, say, clear passwords from memory before you pass that memory to free. Normally, if you just say memset uh, and then free, that memset is always optimized out because it's a dead code store. And developers don't realize that. Whenever you see memset followed by free, it's basically a vulnerability because they're trying to clear it out, but it's not going to happen. Um, so, yeah, it's back and forth. But, you know, basically, you need to just, you know, you just need to know how the language works and program correctly. Uh, well, yeah. I mean, there's, there's, no, there's no substitute for knowledge. Okay, anyone else? I'm having fun, so yeah, sir. Oh, well, I, I think what I was trying to say with those slides is um, um, is that you, if you want to test for the existence of these optimizations, you need to do two things. One is you need to have the strict overflow flag set, and you also need to have the optimizations being performed. Uh, so you have to set strict overflow on or set an opt a high optimization level so it's going to optimize the code in order to get the diagnostics. So if you just set strict overflow and you hit optimization zero, you... Oh, the order doesn't matter, but you need to specify both. If it's not optimizing, it won't diagnose the optimizations. Okay, any other questions? You were recording all this, right? That's good.
Now, now I'm running back in my head, like, who died and sold? Google, <laughs> IBM, hmm. <laughs> Any other questions? Okay, thanks for, that ends the CISO track, I think, for the week. Okay. Thank you very much.